and welcome to part five of sculpting Urzarl in ZBrush. Uh, this is going to be our last segment here where we're going to take a look at finishing out the character, uh, the details and so forth on that and getting that ready to go to the printer. So um, if you've missed our previous episodes one through four, then um, grab that link up in the upper corner up there and go check out some of the previous episodes where we go through uh, blocking out the character and posing him up and, and getting him to this stage. Uh, so here I'm going to go through and sculpt some sp specific pose related um, details on the character. So in, in this part I'm going to go through and and select the, the mane that we have around Urzarl's head and kind of remesh the the object that we have there, I've also split that off as, as its own separate part. And because his head's turned a particular way, uh, I wanted to uh, sculpt the, the fur details into that to kind of indicate which direction, you know, he's facing, which, you know, how his head's turned um, and, and create some more uh, dynamic action uh, on the fur. So that indi it indicates how he's turning his head and it's, it's going a particular direction. So with this point, I'm taking my, you know, favorite carving tool, uh, the Orb Cracks brush. And uh, if you've followed along on our previous episodes, you'll know that there's a, a link in the description down there to um, a place over on Gumroad where I, where I actually downloaded the, the brushes for ZBrush. So you can grab that brush if you're... You know messing around in, in the software and you want to give them a try and and see if they work for you like they're working for me i haven't made any adjustments to the brush at all so uh basically i just use it as is and the cool thing about the way that zbrush works when you're using brushes like this is that uh and I, because i'm on a mac system i use the option key or the alt key i guess if it would be on windows uh to switch back and forth between it you know carving in and then uh, you know raising up a raised edge on it, uh, which is really something that you can't do it as well in in putty or you know traditional sculpting. So like these marks that I would be making, um, I I couldn't make raised ridges in the putty uh, w with my uh, my actual sculpting tools. So I would have to just carve in and leave the ridges and so forth on the outside of that. Um, and then once I get to the end here, uh, I'm showing that uh, you can uh, grab the slide brush, and that's also that's a basic brush that's in that comes in the Z brush uh, brush palette. Uh, and I'm just grabbing the ends of like where some of those tufts wind up, and just kind of pulling those out to create uh, the ends of those fur tufts. Uh, then I'm taking the general move tool and going back and just sort of adjusting where the flow is, you know, where the movement is on the the main and how it would it would flow together um, to create a, a dynamic um, dynamic shape as as he's twisting as he you know he's turning to look off to the side. So I want to want to create a sense of movement in that so I'll, I'll grab I'll use the move tool and, and grab sections of it and, and kind of move it around that also creates a really nice flow to the individual strands of fur uh, to, to, to give them a more uniform shape uh, in this instance I'm going to go back and, and undercut some of those areas so that it looks like the ends of that fur lay against uh, you know where his vest is and so forth to to kind of carve into that um, then the other thing that I, I wanted to kind of mention is the the void under his chin where that that shape is uh, where the, the the main bunches up under there also creates a really nice fill so that when it's molded there won't be a, a space under where his chin is to create problems with the uh, with the mold like like creating an undercut or anything like that. Uh, this is a brush that I made and I, I'll include the link to the, um, the YouTube video where it shows you how to create your own braid brush and it's it's 
it just takes a, a few minutes uh, to go through and, and build that. But then I created this insert mesh tool uh, using the instructions on how to make a braid tool. And then inserted uh, some braid objects on here. So the cool thing about that is they stay live with this little, um, you know, handle, uh, sort of a chain that, that runs through the mesh so that you can adjust it and move it around and get it right in the shape or right in the place that you want it to, to wind up. Uh, so then once all of that's in place, uh, then you can, you know, delete that and it becomes a solid, solid object. Uh, and then I usually go back and I've, I've selected those individually so that I can split those off as their own object and work on them individually. Uh, because uh, they create the kind of mesh that you have to use in order to create the braids uh, is very mechanical looking. It's got these like ridges and so forth on it so that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very mesh looking. So once you go in and divide that mesh up, then it kind of rounds it out and then you can inflate it and create uh, a more rounded look. Uh, with, with this particular braid though, once I got this sized pretty much and, and shaped where I wanted it, I also had to go back to the braids on the side of the head and adjust those so that they fit on the surface of the mane and they wouldn't have any voids or spaces underneath them that would also trap mold material under it and cause that to tear out or, or damage the model or, or create problems with casting. So, you, you know, that's another thing that you have to take into account and look for. So once I got all of the, the braids in place where, you know, I thought they were going to, they were going to sit appropriately, uh, then I went back and inflated them a little bit more and then uh, would carve in the, the individual braids. So basically I would just use this, you know, length of mesh, how it, it, it twists or, or overlaps uh, each other. Cause you, you can see as it's, as it's grouped differently in the, in the poly mesh and, or the poly groups there, uh, all of those are individual strands of, of the braid. So there's like three parts to it. Uh, but then what I did was once I got that situated where I thought, okay, well, it's going to lay against the, the back of his vest and so forth. Then I just uh, meshed that all together. So now it's just one solid object. Uh, and then I could go in and edit that as a singular uh, mesh. So here I'm just going to clean up the end of that. Uh, there's a little little area that's sticking off that's that's coming through. It's creating a problem. So I'm going to take this little uh, cutter tool. Uh, the I've, I believe there's a, there's like a new knife tool in there that's that's really handy for that that kind of thing. So now now that I've got that all as one object, uh, I'm going to go back and. Uh, I'm going to select the uh, masking tool. There's In the masking palette, there's uh, an option in there where it will mask all of the creases down in the, in the crevice of, of an object. And so I'm masking that off so that it'll stay and create really nice creases in the mesh when I inflate it out. So now you can see that those braids are a little bit crisper and I, and basically at this point and then I remesh that and then I'm just using that as a guide to carve in where the braids would go to uh, really punch those up and uh, create a separation in between the the braids so that they'll show up because again this this object itself like when it's when it's finally printed is only going to be a couple of millimeters wide <laughs> on the back of the model so all of these details really have to be exaggerated and uh, increased in order for these details to print and to show up after production. So I'm taking my Orb Cracks brush there again and you know carving in those creases in between the, in between the braids. Uh, and then I'm gonna go back and go over the tops of those to create individual hair strands that would catch you know, highlight, uh, you know, paint highlights when you're painting the model. So there's little ridges uh, of the individual hairs and stuff on that. This is exactly the same thing that I would do if I was sculpting a braid, you know, using putty uh, in the traditional method. 
uh, I would just mark off using my little sculpting tool where the braids would overlap in a crisscross fashion on a little sliver of putty like that on the surface of the model and then go back and then you know take the edge of the tool and cut into it in the shape of you know where those strands would be so same process it's just um, it's in the, in the computer and you can't touch it at this point yet <laughs> until it, it comes out on the printer. So uh, that was one of the most difficult things that I had uh, when I was transitioning from sculpting traditionally over into sculpting digitally was I couldn't actually grab the material and move it or you know, smooth it with my thumb or, or any of the things that I was used to doing. So it's because it's all virtual, you, you know, you, you want to grab the screen and just move a thing and you can't do that. You have to pick a tool and then select an area and then move it. And, you know, uh, so it's, it's a little bit different, you know, in that process, but the, the concept is the same because it's like, well, I just, I want to take this piece of material and move it into a shape or move it into a, a space so that it it represents this object that I'm I'm you know trying to trying to craft. So here I'm taking and, and moving the bits of the the areas of the main so that it, it blends in a little bit more with the braid since those are two separate parts. So once this is meshed together there won't be a seam there it will look like it's all one continuous object. Uh, and if I wanted to and I, I can't remember if I if I did this or not, if these are still two separate objects before export. Um, but I, I may just take those two objects and just mesh them together and then go back and sculpt additional details where that seam would be. Uh, and then just, then there wouldn't be any, any issue with it. But at this point, it's easier to keep those as two separate pieces because then I can, uh, if they're uh, different poly groups, then I can, I can turn poly groups on like we're seeing it here. And it shows me that area that I'm working on in a particular color and it makes it a little bit easier to see, you know, what I'm working on at a given time. Um, so that it's not all blended together. Uh, so then for the, uh, the end of the braid, I just went into uh, insert multi mesh and grabbed a little sphere object and drop that in there and then, uh, split that off as its own object so that I could move it around and manipulate it, you know, independently of the braid. So at this point, uh, once I get it into position, uh, then I'll, I'll mesh it so that the, um, I guess the vault, the resolution of it matches the resolution of the, the braid object so that those are the same resolution. So when I sculpt on it, it's, it's going to show up with the same kind of details. Uh, so then I'm take, I go back and take the orbs crack brush and sculpt the lines of the um, of the fur over the top of that and then that's going to give it the the texture so that it looks like the end of where the braid is gathered up the the little hairs that are sticking out of that so then once i get that kind of moved around well we're also going to need sort of a clasp or um, like a, a strap or something like that so that the end of the braid is tied off. So I'll go back to the, the brush palette. And once I get that into position, um, then I'm, I'm gonna grab a, um, a cylinder tool or a cylinder object and insert that in there for that, that strap. This here is just basically moving it around, make sure the, the volume is correct so that it sits off the surface of the, uh, of the, the back of the vest, it, you know, large enough to where it, it'll show up as an object. So then, like I would do uh, there again, sculpting traditionally, I would take a little piece of putty and, and spread it across there. In this instance, I have to kind of remesh this uh, this cylinder so that it's got the same resolution as the braid that I had before so that when I manipulate it, the details will come out correctly. It'll be smooth like it's supposed to be uh, or like what it's supposed to be representing. Uh, then I'm gonna uh, taper the ends of that so that it, it creates these little ridges that sort of stick out 
and this is the same uh, the same kind of a look as I would do if it was in putty where I would take a you know a rounded tool or like a silicon you know clay shaper and work in an indention uh, along the middle of that and, and what that does is it creates a nice little ridge around the top and bottom of that strap so that when you paint that you've got little edges that stick up to catch the, the paint for the highlights on, uh, on painting that. So at this point uh, I'll you know work over the rest of the model and kind of refine the uh, the creases in the fabric and um, <clears throat> the anatomy, like if there's uh, creases or more details, like around the arms or whatever, make um, adjustments to the proportions or anything if I need to, if I, I look at the overall model. Uh, and then I'll, I'll add, I have a little tab that, that goes on the, the, the feet for the base uh, that's got our uh, copyright logo and so forth on there. So I'll attach that to the bottom of the model before that it'll go to print. And then if there's anything, if we're making our own molds here where I'm going to uh, need vents or anything in the mold, I will go ahead and attach those to the mesh at this point. Like you can see here, the sprue with the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with the weapon, weapon hands. Uh, so those, those have got little vent sprues on them so that, um, that the air will vent out and it'll it'll create an in-port uh, gate for me to insert the to put the resin and so, so forth in there so that comes in really handy uh, I can go ahead and add all of these on to the model before it goes to mold so at this point uh, the mesh ha is still uh, a bunch of individual pieces and whenever the, the mesh goes to the printer it likes to be all one part so what I'll do is I will mesh all of these pieces together so that they're one object one watertight object uh, with no internal geometry or anything and once the the object is all meshed together uh, then I, I have to <laughs> throw away basically it's, there's a process that's called um, uh, decimation and what it does is it reduces the resolution of the model and it's it, you can kind of think of it or I, I like to think of it as like what you would do with a Photoshop file if you're going to export it as like a, a JPEG or to, to put on the internet it's it's kind of a similar type of thing where it it takes the mesh that you have and then reduces the amount of um, faces and so forth on it so it creates all these little triangles for the STL file and it just reduces the file size so that 3d printers can uh, read that file and see uh, you know what the surface of it is without uh, it being you know uh, a lot of unnecessary uh, points on the mesh uh, taking up a lot of uh, memory there's probably uh, you know more tech savvy folks out there than I am uh, that could probably explain that a little bit better about what the algorithms are that, <laughs> that actually do all of this but that's not really important just as long as you realize that it's like well once you do this there's no going back to that so I usually create you know a copy of the file that I was working on because if I needed to go back and adjust anything like the belt buckle or the knee pads or anything it's like well you can't really separate those off of this because this is all it's all meshed together as as one object now so then I could just go back to that make the adjustments or changes that I need to and then just mesh it you know remesh it again as a, uh, uh, decimate it and then export it as an STL file so then to save this out as an STL uh, I have a ruler object that's in this which is 50 millimeters tall by 50 millimeters across and the software recognizes that so then in my little uh, export 3d print hub export palette i'll pick the y-axis on that and it shows that it's 50 millimeters and then i'll pick where i want that to go to which is in my files folder on the desktop and then just export all of those objects and i want them to be named as you know what they are like you know body and sprue or you know weapons or whatever the parts are that I've, I've named 
in that object. So then the software will read that, that ruler and then size everything based against what that 50 millimeter ruler is. So it'll save those STL files out. There's my ruler object. And it's like, well, I don't really need that now. So I just throw that away. And what I'm left with is a, a correctly sized STL mesh that uh, the printer will read. So now I'll be able to go over and put that STL file in my slicer software, which the one that I use is Chittabox. And it's, uh, it's got great pro profiles in it for the um, uh, Frozen Sonic Mini 4K that we print our stuff on right now. Uh, I'm looking at upgrading to the 8K printer uh, that they have, uh, that, but that's, that'll probably be summertime or, or after that I'll be able to do that. So, so right now the 4K printer does really good for us. Um, we're able to get excellent print masters out uh, on that printer. So, uh, so usually what I'll do is he comes in um, laying flat on the print bed. So I'll usually rotate that about 90 degrees. And then I'll come back off of that, maybe about 12 to 17 degrees, maybe leaning him back. Uh, and that, that sort of breaks that 90 degree plane. So uh, that the, the print software, that, well, the, the physics of the printer uh, actually work better if there's not flat surfaces to print against. So I'll usually orient those a little bit uh, off the axis in order to create uh, better uh, surface profiles. So once I get that adjusted, then I can go in and I'll usually start with auto supports. I don't just hit the auto supports and just leave it because the, the software is not as smart as it likes to think that it is. Uh, so it'll give you some guidelines, some ideas of like, oh, hey, I think this is where the supports are going to go. But I always double check that just to make sure that it didn't, you know, miss something or there's like an area that it, it didn't take into account or whatever. Um, and then what I also like to do is, it usually only gives like one or two supports on the bottom of the, uh, the tab for the, where the sprue tab is. And that's generally not enough. So I'll just go in and delete those. And then I'll pick like a heavy, the heavy supports and put those on the, the ends of that in order to create a more you know, stable and secure area that's going to grab a hold of those sprues and make sure that it, the, the model doesn't come off of the build plate. So I'll add those on there, uh, wherever those, you know, happen to show up on the sprue. Now, when I'm casting these, this is where I'm going to put the, the syringe with the, with the resin in it into the mold. And that's, that's where the, the resin is going to flow through. Uh, in this instance, uh, this model is going to go over to uh, another, uh, molding process for the CO cast thermoplastic. So the, the plastic will still flow in, you know, that direction. And then when you get this model, you can just, you can trim that off, you know, clip it off. If you don't have a base that's, um, you know, slotted that that tab will fit into, or you can pin it, you know, on a resin base or whatever. It gives you a lot of options in order to, to base this mini, you know, once you get ready to put it together. Uh, so then I'll go through and look at, you know, some other areas like under here. It's like, well, I think it needs, you know, some more supports where those little claws are <laughs> to make sure that the, the tips of the claws come out okay. Um, so then I'll, I'll look over the model and, you know, once that's ready to go, then um, I won't have to, to do a, a bunch of that. Uh, I can just replicate this model after all of the supports are on there. And usually I'll try to fill up the build plate uh, with as many of those as I can fit on there, depending on how big the model is and how many are going to need to go to mold. Uh, at this point, I'm just going to delete this weapon sprue because I'm not going to put that on this, this print run. I'll just, uh, you know, run a separate print run for that, that part on its own. So that way I can maximize however many uh, models that I'm going to want on this particular batch. Uh, and I think I printed like two batches of these 
in order to send out to Metal Oak Casting so that uh, they, they would have enough to, to make the mold. Um, and then the, uh, they used whatever they wanted, you know, whatever would fit on there, and then they just sent, sent the rest of them back. So uh, if you like that, if you liked following along with this, be sure and, you know, like the video, uh, click the like on the other videos and, you know, subscribe for us. That really helps out the channel and we will see you next time.